Any of that stuff look familiar? <laughs> All right, so a couple announcements before we get started. So one of the things we've been talking about over the summer is uh, how do we continue to have lasting impact outside of just what happens on the Sunday morning? So how do we continue to uh, take the message that people are hearing and the scripture that we have and do more with it? Like how do you learn more, go back, talk about, and go deeper with? Uh, so if you got a bulletin today, you're going to see something new inside of it. And it's this little insert, and this insert says relationship goals. So inside of it, uh, each week from now, on you're going to get an insert and in the future it's going to have uh, hole punches in it three hole punch and you'll be able to buy a binder so I have binders downstairs for like 10 bucks and the idea is is that you'll have one of these sheets take notes on it take the scripture have a binder take it home put it in and then if you want to go back and talk about it you'll have them categorized like we want to go back and talk at home about or if you're leading a small group like maybe you're leading a small group or you're mentoring somebody uh, that you'll have notes that you can go back to and refer back to or if you just want to grow personally and you want to go back and use it that you'll have notes to be able to go back and do that because we know this right that that the Sunday morning like the message that happens on Sunday morning is only a small part of spiritual growth long term Right? It's just something to get you moving towards something uh, to allow you to grow deeper. So we're just hoping this is a tool that you can use. Uh, so for people that don't get bulletins, you know, uh, we're hoping that you would start grabbing them, taking them, and using these inserts to be able to uh, grow deeper. The other thing is our family launch party. So if you're on social media, you've probably been uh, seeing us advertise this. So the idea is uh, to be able to kick off our ministry year uh, with our children and youth. Uh, one of the things that they talked about was the impact that we can have, not just on children and youth, but families too. Right? We don't want it to just be uh, kids, and we don't want it to be just youth, because we know to have total impact, you can't just reach the kids, and you can't just reach youth. you got to reach families. Right? Like That's the way uh, we know uh, long-term to be able to have impact. Uh, so the family launch party is an opportunity for you to be able to come to, to be, invite other families that don't have uh, a church home to be able to come and experience uh, what life church is like. It's an opportunity for you to come and mingle with other families that you might not know, because uh, we know that, again, three services different people. You might not know people here or have a chance to build relationships. So it's an opportunity for you to come build relationships with other families, maybe meet some new couples to make them feel welcome. That would be the other part of it is, is every new couple that's coming, you know, is trying to find a connection of some sort and trying to figure out how they can uh, connect with other families. And so being able to connect with you would be helpful. Um, so we'd love, so the way that you can respond to this is either come, be a part of it, um, volunteer and help out at, invite families too, uh, so that they can experience. If we have families that don't have a, a church home or kids that don't have a church home, invite them to it. Um, and then again, ultimately we'd love for them to become a part of Life Church, right? So come, uh, enjoy and be a part of the family here at Life Church. So family launch party, put it down. Uh, don't miss it. It'll be a really great time. All right. So we're starting a new series called Relationship goals. Now, I'm excited about this series because I think it, it brings a lot of different dynamics that uh, I want to be able to talk through and, and discuss with people and, and think about as we uh, dive into this idea of relationships. Now, the reason it's relationship goals is this. is I, I, If I look at most people's life, this is what I would say. If I was coaching you, if I was doing your marriage counseling, if I was whatever aspect of my life I was in with you, I'd tell you goals drive mission Mission drives impact, and impact changes the world, right? And so if you don't have goals in your life, most of the time you don't have mission. Like I would say a lot of people in our, in our society today, we're just trying to get done what we can get done today, right? Because we're busy enough in the things that we have to, to get done. Just trying to get done what we have for today, it's hard to think about tomorrow, Right? And if we're thinking about tomorrow, it's at the end of the day with a little bit of stress thinking, am I really going to be able to get it done? Because you moved over about 10 things that you didn't get done the day before. So I'm saying if you want to have lasting impact, which that's why we're here, right? So as human beings on this earth, as Christ followers or people who love Jesus, we want to have lasting impact. So the way to have lasting impact is to have goals, right? To, to, to be able to look at things in the future. Those goals then should drive mission, right? So the mission of your life is going to be something. Once you have a mission, it will then drive action or impact, right? So it'll make you do something because now you're living missionally, right, with, with a, an idea in mind. And once you have impact, we know that impact is what changes the world, right? Being busy and existing on this earth doesn't change the world, right? We got to be able to figure that out. Now, 
The challenging thing is, is that I think for some people, like just the concept of goals is hard, but for the people that have understood goals, I think they're good at it, maybe personally, or they're good at it from a business perspective, but they struggle when it comes to relationships. Like how do you put goals inside of relationships? And not only goals, right? Like goals that will last, right? That will be impactful goals. In fact, um, since the existence of social media, one of the things that, that's out there is this hashtag relationship goals. So like if you are on uh, Twitter or Instagram, you'll see these pictures of like people hanging out over the, you know, the water or you'll see other things like people that want. Uh, or we found this one, uh, relationship goal, an elderly couple visits 644 of 645 Cracker Barrels, right? Like that was their relationship goal, which... Again, is like, I think that's okay. You know, if like the goal of your relationship was to make sure you could visit um, all of the Cracker Barrels. But at the end of the day, I think we would want deeper relationship goals or deeper goals that will cause mission inside of our relationships that will have lasting impact. Does that make sense? So when I'm doing marriage counseling, one of the things I always talk to couples about is like, what are your goals? What are the goals of, uh, inside of, of, of what you want to do? And most of the time, they talk about individual things. Like, we want to get this job, and we want to get this job, and we want to buy this house, and we want to be able to do. And so not that they're not goals, um, but what I find is, is they're usually not goals that are centered around Christ, and they're usually not goals that then are driven into mission that will have lasting impact. Again, sometimes they are, sometimes they're not, but it's hard, right, to think through that. Or um, if I talk to people who are in like friend groups, like, you know, these, uh, especially girls, like a lot of uh, ladies have great friend groups. Guys, we're, I don't know, somewhere out there. Sometimes we hang out, sometimes we don't. But women are really good at this. Like they have these great friend groups and you talk to them like, so what are your goals of your friend groups? Oh, well, we want to, you know, do this or do that. But it's really not, again, from the standpoint of like, we really talked about inside of our relationship as women, we want to have this lasting impact. And so these are the things uh, that we want to be able to do personally. Like I think if I talk to most of you guys personally, you've probably thought of your goals, right? Like most of you here would probably think of something, some sort of a goal that you had for 2019, even if it was lose a little weight, you know, most of us have. Now, where we get stuck is moving those goals into strategies and can we ever get them fixed out? But most people personally have a goal. If you're in business, and especially if you're a business owner, my guess is you have some goals and you put some strategies together, you're not making any money, right? Like if you're a business owner, you better have some goals and you better have some strategies or at the end of the day, your, your bottom line isn't going to look very good. So our hope is that through this, that we're going to be able to give you some ideas of what it looks like to have goals that can have a uh, mission into the world that can cause impact. Because here's what it says in Proverbs 29, 18. So Proverbs 29, 18 says this. Where there is no revelation, so you're not going to have this up here. This is something you want to take down because Proverbs is a book of wisdom to go back to and look at. And so Proverbs 29, 18 says, where there is no revelation or in some translations where there is no vision, it says the people cast off restraint, but happy is the one who keeps the law, right? So what he's saying is wise is a person, right, who listens to God sets goals and puts things in place to be able to achieve those goals, right? That's, that's the concept. He says, if you don't, you're just going to be given into whatever the, whatever's happening around you, right? So whether it's sin, whether it's busyness, wherever, whatever it is, you're going to get somewhere, but you're not going to get somewhere on purpose, right? The idea is a person with revelation from God sets that revelation into action is going to get somewhere on purpose. Somebody that don't is just going to, you know, fall to whatever the things are around them. That's why it says at the end that wise is the person who is obedient to the law, right? So who puts things in place to be able uh, to understand that. So we would know that we need to be able to have uh, uh, vision and mission to be able to do that. Now, the original design right, is, is to be able to do things together. So we know that the original design of God is for people to be in relationship, right? So if we know the original design is relationships, then we just need to be able to add goals to that. So here are the goals that we're going to be talking about. So for the, these are the four weeks that we're going to be talking about. So being Christ-centered, so that's one of the goals. Being mission-driven, devil-kicking, and covenant-keeping, okay? So the four goals that we're going to be looking at, and we'll talk about them each week, is how do you become Christ-centered, in a relationship, right? How do you become mission-driven? So inside of a relationship, how do you become mission-driven? Now, we know this, 
right? That if the original design is relationship, and we know that in relationship you're better than you are by yourself, the guess is, right, or based upon what scripture, it's not really a guess, that if your relationship is mission driven, that you will have an enemy that will try to destroy your mission, right? Like if you're in, because here's what Satan already knows. Satan knows the end and Satan knows what's going on. So he knows that if you do things together, you're far better than you are doing things separately. So the one thing that Satan's going to try to do is break up your relationships, right? So we better figure out how to keep Satan from breaking up relationships because he knows inside of relationships, you better than, better than you are individually. So we're going to talk about how do you become devil kicking? Like how do you make sure that we understand that? The last one is covenant keeping because anybody that's been in a relationship knows that it's hard. Amen. Come on. I mean, if you're in a marriage relationship, is it always easy? Let me find all the good husbands out there that are going, oh yeah, right, looking over at their wife. It's not, right? Being in a marriage relationship isn't easy. How about being in a friend relationship? Is it always easy? Being in a friend relationship? No, there are times when it would be easier to just do life alone. It would be way easier to not have friends. be way easier just to do it by yourself because you don't have to answer anybody. You don't have to think about anybody. You don't have to worry about hurting anybody. But we know that we're going to need to commit to a covenant, right? And the covenant of marriage, the covenant of friendship, and the covenant of relationships. We've got to make sure that we're on that same page. So those are going to be our four goals. So we're going to give them to you. If you didn't have any, here's some you can work from. Now you can add to them, but those are going to be the four that we're going to talk about now. One of the things that we've heard when we put out, hey, we're going to do relationship goals, is the people would be like, I'm not married, so now what, right? Or I'm young, and so what am I supposed to do throughout this whole message? How is this going to make any sense to me? And so what I want you to, to I'm going to give you some, some ways to interact with this message from a different perspective. So in this, remember that we're talking about relationships, not just marriage relationship, right? So if you are single... Okay, listen up, young people. So if you're single and you ever want to get married, right, this message, these goals are a great opportunity for you to put together a playbook, right, of, of the things that, that you should do, right, and a guidebook on who you should pick. Guys, girls, do you understand what I'm saying? Right, like a playbook on how to understand how to uh, approach relationships and a guidebook on when you're looking for the right guy, girls, use the guidebook, right? Because they're not all good. Guys, when you're looking for the right lady, use the guidebook because at the end of the day, you don't want to get into it and be like, man, she was so good looking, but oh, I can't stand her now that I'm living with her, right? And you think, oh, that doesn't happen. That happens, right? Like that happens with people. So be able to use it. Or inside, of, inside of, uh, of if you're single and you never want to get married, right, or you're never going to get married again, understand that you inside of your relationship, whether it's with a person or a group of people, still matters, right? How you do relationship with those people and how you do relationship being that you're mission-driven and that you're keeping the devil out because the devil wants you to do life alone is important. So you should use this in your friend group, right, the people that you're in relationship with. If you're married, right? I hope that you will look at this message as a way to maybe do a reset, right? Because I know in my own marriage, it's easy to just keep, get busy and get going and forget that we should have goals and that we should have, uh, you know, places that we're going and that we should revisit those things and understand what those things are. So don't check out, like if you're single or you're young or if you're older and single and you're never going to get married, don't check out because the principles are all the same, right? Relationships are relationships, the playbook, the guidebook is all the same. You just apply it to the relationships you're in. Does that make sense? So whatever relationships you're in or are going to be in, you would apply these principles uh, to those things. But we first, right, we need to establish this because for me personally, I'll just tell you this, like I enjoy being in relationship with people, but relationships are hard, right? Like I get busy as a guy, a lot of things going on. I usually don't take a lot of time to build long-lasting relationships, right? Like carve times out of my day to just hang out with people, right? Like that's not at the highest priority of my life. But I realize that God says relationships are really important. And through these relationships, we have, we have to be able to use those to build. So in Genesis 
uh, 2, 18 through 24, we're going to establish why meaningful relationships are important. Then we're going to go into the first goal, Christ-centered. What does it look like to be Christ-centered? Um, and talk about how you can then implement that in your life. So Genesis 2, 18 through 24, here's what it says. Then God said, it's not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the wild animals and all the birds in the sky, and he brought them to man to see uh, what he would name them. And, whether, and whatever the man called each of the living creature, that was his name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds in the sky, and all of the wild animals. So he's Adam's hanging out with all of his animal friends, right? So he's chilling out with all of his animal friends that he just named. But there's a problem, right? And it says, but for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep, and while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and then closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he'd taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. The man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. This is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. So it starts with identifying relationships this way. Man... And women were not be made to be in relationship with just animals, which are way easier than people, right? Like being in relationship with animals are way easier than people. Like we have these Australian shepherds. I love them to death. They're probably one of the best dogs we've ever had. So I go out and feed calves every day. These things follow me every single place that I go. I go into one room, they feed with me, they lay down, you know, and then I go to the next room and lay down. And I might not pet them for two weeks, right? Like, I, they just follow me around, never talk to them, just throw food on the ground, you know, don't pay that much attention to them. If I sit down for five seconds, turn on the hot water tank and sit down, those suckers are up there wanting pet, you know, loving on me. Like, I showed them zero attention and they still like me. Try that with somebody, a human being. <laughs> See how that goes. Like, that's not going to go over very well, right? Like, it's way easier to be in a relationship with an animal, right? Because they love you regardless of you at least most of the time. So God says, but it's not okay to just be in relationship with animals, right? Like that's not okay. In fact, we used to have somebody a long time ago, I talked to them about like, what's your ministry? And they're like, well, my ministry is animals. And I said, I don't know, let's talk about that. How can your ministry be animals? Because animals don't have souls. She's like, I don't like people, right? I don't like people. So I'm going to minister to animals. I'm like, I don't know, you better figure out how to like people. Because at the end of the day, the animal piece, like you can love them and you know, spend time with them. But at the end of the day, if you're going to substitute them for people long term, that's not going to work, right? Like we need to be in relationship with people. So he establishes that right away, right? So that's in all relationships. People are made to be in relationship with other people, even though it's hard and maybe you've given up on it, right? He's still made to be in relationship. That's the way he designed you, original design. Then he also says from a, a marriage perspective, right, that, that if you do choose to get married, here's what you need to know. You are better together than you are separate, right? That you in your relationship are better together than you are separate. Because here's what you're going to find out. Just because you're married doesn't mean you're on the same page. Married couples, nobody other than me, right? Like, Seriously, like you can be married and love each other and it doesn't mean that you're on the same page, right? It doesn't mean you're going always in the same direction. That's not the way that it goes. We usually have inside of marriages or relationships, you have your own agenda, right? You're like you're together and you share some things together, but you have your way you're going, they have their way, and sometimes you come together, right? And you talk about the day and you talk about what's going on, but a lot of times inside of relationships, we're not together. We don't operate as a team, right? Scripture says very clearly that in a relationship that you are better together than you are separate. And so you need to be a team. So he establishes that for us right away and makes sure that we would understand that, right? That we as couples or people in relationships, so first to anybody that's in relationship, you need to stay in relationship. And for those that are married, understanding that you're better as a team than you are separate. So here's the first goal, right? So this is what we talked about in the beginning. So how do you become Christ-centered? And why should that be the first goal? I think everyone wonder why, like, why the first goal being Christ-centered? And, and remember, right, what I said from the beginning, right? Goals drive mission, right? Mission drives impact. Impact changes the world, right? Whatever is in the center of your life, you're going to see this in a little bit. Whatever's in the center of your life will be what you set goals for, okay? 
Like whatever's in the center of your life will be what you set goals for. So being Christ-centered, and you'll see how this works here in just a second. So being Christ-centered will drive the goals that you have. So here's what scripture says about being Christ-centered. So Matthew 22, 36 through 37 says, teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? So the, one of the Pharisees was coming up. There's like a ton of different things that they're supposed to be doing. He's trying to figure out if I want to focus my time. How do I focus my time? This is what Jesus replied to him. Jesus replied to him, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your mind. That's the first and greatest commandment. Then you'll see later on it says, and we're going to talk about this later, once you love the Lord your God with all of your heart, mind, and soul, it says, then love other people, right? Relationships. Like that's what it tells you to be able to do. But you first have to love Christ with all of your heart, mind, and soul to be able to love other people, right? Right? Like to be able to have good relationship, you got to be able to love Jesus, right? Like to be able to give, I tell uh, wives and husbands this all the time, to be able to love your wife well, guys, you better be able to love Jesus well because you'll never be able to give your wife what she deserves if you're not getting it from Jesus. You just won't. You don't have it in you. There's no man in here that, that can just give what he has without Christ and give his wife what she deserves. Right? The same with wives to the husbands. I mean, you need to be full of Jesus, especially with us sometimes, to be able to put up with us and be able to give us what we, what we need. Like, that's the way that it works. So Christ has to be in the center of that. Now, back to what I was describing earlier. So when we talk about goals, you know, lead to mission and goes to impact. So if you're going to look at a diagram of any, anybody that's talked to you about setting goals, they'll, they'll draw these diagrams. So there's a circle in the middle and then another circle and then another circle. So here's what they'll tell you. Like in the middle, whatever's in the center of your life will drive the actions of your life, right? So it's center, whatever's center of your life. And for a lot of people, this changes. Like one day it might be kids. One day it might be money. One day it might be food. One day it might be like whatever's at the center of your, your being is going to De define or determine whatever your actions are. Does that make sense? So whatever in the middle defines the actions of your life. And so for us, what we're trying to figure out then is how do we put Christ in the center? Because if he's not, this is what we know. So if any of you guys have been in friend relationships before, have you ever been in friend groups where you have that person that's self-centered? You know what I mean? Like the whole relationship group is all about them getting what they want and they use the relationship group about you know what I'm saying? Like that person loves you guys as long as they can get whatever they want, right? Because in the center of them is self, right? So whatever they're doing is driven by the motivation that they want what they want, right? So self-centeredness, actions of self-centeredness is, is determined because they are self-centered. So uh, the other one would be this, is, and, and young ladies, looking up, listen to this for a second. If you're looking for a guy when you're younger, 6th, 7th, 8th, ninth, 10th grade, you know, you're in high school, remember, sometimes what's in the center of boys is hormone-driven, right? So the decisions that they're making in relationships are driven by the satisfaction of their hormones, right? Like, that's what drives the relationship. So they're going to pick the girls who will satisfy their desire, Right? And so a lot of times the choice of who they pick is all determined by what's at the center of their life, right? Is hormones and the thought of how they can be able to get those things. So I just tell them, or guys, I'm like, if you have that girl that's, that's always taking the selfies and putting them on Instagram, right? And always has those things that it's like always about her, like she's always centered around, you know, somebody affirming who she is. You know what I mean? Like, you ever been around people? Like, they have to affirm who they are by putting a picture out there, and they take it 20 times so they can get enough likes. And if they get enough likes, then they feel affirmed. You know what I'm saying? Right? Like, have you guys been on Instagram? Come on, I'm not on it that much, and you see it. Right? This is what happens with women. Sometimes they need that affirmation. And so I'm telling guys, steer away from that, because there's going to be a time you can't get her what she wants. Right? And she's just going to find whoever the next person that's going to give her enough affirmation Right? Because she's not getting her affirmation from where she deserves or where she should be. So if she's trying to get it from you, you're only going to give it too long until it goes to the next person. Right? So look for those types of things, what's at the center of their life. If you're in a marriage relationship, think about it this way. You know, so those are you know, up-and-coming relationships. If you're in a marriage relationship, you ever see marriage relationships that are job-centered? Like every decision that you make are determined by the job that you're going to take? 
So whether you move, don't move, whether you do or don't do, it's all determined by whatever the, the, the job is. And again, I'm not, you're going to see how this all plays out. I know some of you give me a look like, I just made a decision on a job. I'm not saying that, but when the job is the center of the decision of everything that you do, right, and, and it drives all the actions of your life, then every decision that you'll make will be based upon your job, right? Or you ever see uh, people that have kids where their, their relationship is all kid-centered? Yeah, come on, man. I mean, there's a lot of times, and I see this with couples, like their kids are young and you spend all the time, and we, we were one of those people. I mean, we, we, luckily we had eight of them, so we couldn't give them too much attention. You know, if we had a small amount of them, you know, we would have been a lot worse off than we were, but we had eight kids, and so we're trying to, like, spread out all the attention. But if you're going down that road and all of your attention is focused on the children, and the children are gone someday, and then you look at each other, then what? You're looking around like, who are you? You know what I mean? Because the whole center of your life has always been driven by your children. Not that it's not okay to do things with your kids and spend time with your kids or do all that stuff. But if the center is that, then you're going to have a problem uh, in the future. And or uh, money driven, like you make all of your decisions based upon money. So like all of your financial decisions or all the, the, the actions of your life are driven by we need to make more money. You know, we need to earn more money. We need to save more money. So every action or decision that we make is driven by that compared to, right, what, what we're going to look at and say, well, what does it look like if your life is Christ-centered, right? So if your life is Christ-centered, then all of the decisions you make will be driven out of Christ being at the center. So how do you do that, right? Well, it starts like this. Now, this might be a big surprise for a lot of us. It starts with you individually before you can have it in a relationship. Does that make sense? So if you're not Christ-centered, yourself, then you can't be Christ-centered in your relationship. So if you personally aren't working on your relationship to be centered with Christ, and you're d depending on your spouse to give you everything that you need, you will be sorely disappointed at some point in your life. Right? I tell my wife would be a great testimony to this. She said, like, listen, it's a good thing I love Jesus because there were times that I needed Mike and he wasn't there, and it's a good thing I had Jesus. You know what I mean? Like, that's just the, that's the reality of the world today, right? Like, we're not going to be able to meet all the needs of our spouse. That's not the way it works. You're not going to be able to meet the needs of all the people you're in relationship with. If you do, right, and if you need that, like, from other people, you're going to be sorely disappointed at some point because people can't meet those needs, whether it's a friend relationship, right? Like, if you're going into a dating relationship, guys, girls, pick a man who's Christ-centered, because if he's you centered right now, you're gonna have a major problem someday. You see what I'm, you understand? Like you have to pick a man who's Christ centered. You have to pick somebody that finds his satisfaction in something other than you, right? If you don't and he only finds his satisfaction in you, things will not go well. They just won't. Things are not gonna be the way they're, they're supposed to be. If you're in a friend group where you're, you have to have each other and you don't have something else in there, you're going to have a problem, right? We need to be Christ-centered. So the first thing to be able to have and achieve the goal of being Christ-centered is you individually need to evaluate your relationship with Christ. Where are you? And is it centered around Jesus? So if you look at the actions of your life, what you do, are they centered around Jesus in the center? Right? Like there's nothing wrong with back to what I said about, so if a job moves you, as long as Jesus is at the center of it, what does it matter? right? Because the job moving you, if Jesus is still the center, the mission is still the same. The job's a job, right? The job is only a, a, an ability for you to be able to be on mission to reach people, right? So the, the job moves you. Kids, like does it matter if you go to all the kids stuff and you pay attention to them if Jesus is at the center? Because you know what's at all those games? People who need Jesus. So as long as Jesus Christ is at the center of your life, it doesn't matter how many travel games you go to. Does it matter how many swim meets you go to? Does it matter how many 4-H fairs you go to? Does that part matter? If you spend time with your kid at horse shows? It doesn't matter. Why? Because in the middle of it, why are you at the horse show to begin with? Is it just for your kid? No, it's not just for your kid, right? It's an opportunity to show Christ to your child and show Christ to the people around you. Does that make sense? I feel like I'm losing you. <laughs> Like, if we have Christ in the center of all of these things, then whatever happens outside of the circle, as long as Christ is in the center, the mission's always the same, okay? So Christ stays at the center of it. So it starts with you individually. 
then it start, then it goes to or moves to, because this, this is what I've seen, people who have individual relationships with Jesus Christ who never talk about that relationship with their spouse. Do you know what I mean? Like you're doing it and you've done your quiet time and God spoke to you in some amazing ways and you're doing it and you're not, you're not talking to anybody about it. You're like, this is what God has for me. And so you're going this way and this is what God has for me. And now we're going this way. Again, God will speak to you. And I'm going to speak from personal experience. Like I did this wrong early on in ministry. So when I was in ministry early on, you know, uh, love my wife to death. You know, we, I decided I'm going to get in ministry. I'm going to be a youth pastor because God wants me to be a youth pastor. And Cherry, you need to raise kids, right? And so she's raising little kids and I'm out being a youth pastor. And so God has something for me and I'm going out and I'm doing and I'm doing and I'm doing and I'm not sharing it all with her. You know, I'm not talking to her about it. I'm not, you know, and even if I did talk to her about it, it's the only thing I ever talked to her about. So she felt like it was nothing more than just me coming back telling her what I'm doing in my life and nothing that's going on and how she could be a part of it. And that did not go well. You know what I mean? That does not go well. This is what I learned then. Then Sherry, Sherry and I talked and we, we figured this out. And I understood, like, like, I loved being in ministry, but the only way for me to be successful long-term in ministry is that we do it together. There's no possible way to be in ministry and do it alone. If you're not together and you're not doing it together and you're not on the same page, and it doesn't mean that you both have to be doing the same thing, but you both have to be on the same page. Does that make sense? If you're not both on the same page, then you're not going to be able to do it. And that's not just in marriage. That's in your relationships with other people, right? Like you need to be, you have your own individual relationship, but you know this, right? In a friendship, you can do more together than you can do separate. Right? So you can be out individually doing your own thing, but as a women's group, a men's group, a small right? relationship, you can have more impact than you can have going out and doing individual ministry by yourself. Relationships are important. It's the same thing inside of your marriage. You can have impact, but you're going to have more impact if you do it together as a team. Right? So you need to be able to, to talk about that. Now, that can happen in a lot of different ways. Right? There's a lot of different ways that you can be on the same page, but it starts with having conversations that are more than just about what you're going to eat, where you're going to go, where the kids need to end up, and how much money do we owe. Right? Because isn't that most of the conversations? Seriously? I mean, you get home, you're like, here's what happened today, and did we get Johnny to this place, and he was late, and they were mad, and then this is what happened at this, and I mean, you just discuss about meaningless things of the day, and then you're so tired when you go to bed, ain't, I mean, ain't nothing happening, right? Like you're just going to exist and you're just going to get by. And the meaningful conversations that you have about, because this is what we're going to be talking about, so next week's going to be mission-driven. All right, so you can be thinking about this in your mind. I believe for every relationship that you're in today, whether it's a friend relationship or a marriage relationship, you should be on mission. What's your mission? Because when you're on mission, you're talking about it, Right? Like, if you set a goal and you're on mission, you're talking about that mission when you're both involved in it. The only time you're not talking about it, when you're not involved in it, when you're not together doing it. So you should be on mission, and so we're going to talk about how that fits in there next week. But you have to have those meaningful conversations. You have to bring your spiritual lives that are individual right now and bring them together. God is saying something to you individually, but what's he saying to you together? Right? And that's not just for marriage. I'm saying it for everybody in this room. You have an individual relationship, but what's God saying together for your friend group, young guys? What's he saying for your friend group that you guys that hang out together? You're all listening to him separately, but what does he want you to do together as a team? You know, what does he want you to do inside of your small group? What does he want you to do? So relationship, same inside of your marriage. You're getting up and you're having your quiet, at least I hope you're having your quiet time and I hope you're talking to God and you're hearing something individually, but what's he saying to you together? Because God will never say something to you that's just for you alone. Amen, right? It's not just for you alone. It's to be able for you guys to be able to do together. All right, so the band's going to come back up. Let me give you a couple things to think about here um, at the end. So a couple things. It's one thing for you to try. All right, so I'm going to give you, so just think about one thing this week. So go ahead and put that up. The one thing this week uh, that will help your life get centered, okay? So if you're struggling with being Christ-centered, what's one thing this week? And you could write that in your notes that you're taking. Like, what's one thing that I could do this week? Uh, to put Christ in the center of my life? Like, what is that? The other part of it is, is try this. I know this is challenging. I'm still working through this a little bit. What would it look like to pray with somebody that you're in relationship with right now at least once a week, right? So think about your, if you're, your spouse, 
What would it look like for you to get together once a week and pray together, right? Just take an opportunity. It doesn't have to be a long one, so don't, guys, don't worry. You're not going to be there for two hours, and, you know, and just take a minute every day to sit down with your wife and talk about what does it look like? What, what can we be praying about together? Because here's what you'll find out when you're on mission together, you want to pray together. Right? Like when you're on mission together, you're going to want to pray together. That just happens naturally. So once we start to develop this, you can be praying about um, those same things and, and, and try that inside of your life. If you're, you're, you're not married or you're single, what would it look like for you to get together with somebody that you're in a relationship with right now one time a week and pray for something that's about you together and not you separate? Right? So what would it look like for you to get together with someone who is like-minded, Christ-centered, and pray about something that you two together could do separately. If you're in high school right now and you have a friend group, what would it look like for your friend group to get together once a week and pray? Take an opportunity once a week and pray because God wants you on mission inside of your schools, inside of your colleges, wherever you're at. What would it look like for you to pray for those for those things? Now, I want to end like this. So I've been thinking about this a lot. I shared this with my staff this week is that a lot of times I leave it with this assumption that I hope you make some decisions. Right? Like I hope you change make that decision, even when it comes to your relationship with Christ. Like, I'll give you suggestions. I'll be like, you know what? If you're not Christ-centered and you don't know Jesus, my suggestion is home. go home and get it right. Right? Figure it out on your own. And really had this time when I was off, really had this thing inside of me that said, you know, you need to allow people to make that decision. Right? Like, you need to come to a place where you allow people to make a decision to, to take a step in their life on a Sunday morning and allow those things to happen. So we're going to do that next four weeks, we're going to give you at the end of every service a couple opportunities to make decisions, right? Put markers in the ground that today uh, will be different for you. The first decision is this. This all might sound good, right? Because remember this. You can, you can't be Christ-centered if you're not saved by Jesus Christ. I think you can't. I mean, you can want a Christ-centered marriage. You can want a Christ-centered life. You can want your kids to be Christ-centered. Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. You can't have any of those things. And we can talk about being mission driven and we can talk about, you know, devil kicking. We can talk about all this stuff in the future, but it starts with your personal relationship with Jesus. So today, I want to give you an opportunity. If you have never accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, I'm going to give you a chance to do that today. If you're at a place where you've walked away and you need to come back, this is going to be an opportunity for you to say, I'm recommitting. I'm going to, I'm going to pull him back in the center. And then at the end of it, we're going to give you an opportunity. If you haven't been Christ in your relationships, we're going to give you the chance to say today, I'm talking to change. So whether it's my high school friends, whether it's my uh, friend group, whether it's my group of girls that get together, we're talk, whether it's your marriage, it's going to be, we're going to change some things, and this is going to be uh, the way that, it, that it's going to happen. So here's how it's going to work. So we have everybody that, that wants to have an opportunity to uh, give their life to Jesus Christ, we're going to bow our heads, we're going to pray here for a second and to give you a chance to accept Jesus Christ or give you a chance to recommit your life back to Jesus Christ. And then we're going to continue on with the prayer. And for all of those who want to be able to recenter themselves, we're going to give you a chance to be able to do that. So would everybody bow their heads and, and pray with me. So Lord, just today I pray for anybody in the room today that, is, that has been thinking about this decision, this decision on whether or not I should uh, accept Jesus Christ as my Savior and Lord and that kind of dancing around it or have been somebody who as a young person who has accepted uh, you Christ but has walked away and want to recommit today we want to give um, everybody that opportunity to know you personally Jesus and so here's what I want you to do so with everybody's heads down and their eyes closed if that's you today and you want to give your life to Jesus Christ and you want to commit yourself or you want to recommit your life to Jesus Christ I just want you to raise your hand and just make as a declaration like this is me. I want to be able to give my life to Jesus Christ. I want to be able to make that decision. I want to be able to, to, to take that step. I want to be able to recommit. I want to be able to do uh, inside of my life. If that's you today, I want you to be able to, to take that opportunity and be able to do those things. So we thank the Lord for those who have made those commitments today, Lord. And if that's you, just pray this prayer. Right? You can all pray along with this person. You can pray this prayer saying, hey, Heavenly Father, I'm not complete without you. I recognize.
realize today that the only way to complete my life is you to forgive my sins. Lord, today will you forgive me? And today I want to take that step into new life with you. And because of that proclamation, those who raise your hands today are, are into new life. If you're one who's recommitting, we just pray this along with you, Lord. Heavenly Father, we, we know that we've walked away. We've, we've slid away from the things that you've wanted in our lives. And so today, Lord, I want to recommit myself to you and being a follower of you. I, I want to recommit my life to you today. And because of that, new steps and new desires and new things will come out of that. If you're here today and you're saying, you know what, uh, I want Christ-centered relationships. I might have been Christ-centered myself, but, you know, it's not in my marriage, it's not in my friend group, it's not in the people around you. If that's you today, you just raise your hand and say, this is what I want. I want a, I want a Christ-centered marriage, I want a Christ-centered relationship. I want to take that step today. I want to be able to, to, to move in those places. I want to do the things that it's going to take to be able to, to move into those relationships and not just exist, but exist with impact. Father, I pray a blessing over all of these people that are here today, Lord, that they will understand the impact that they can have in this world. That if they will be Christ-centered in their relationships, Lord, we know and we're praying against the enemy who's coming to attack and destroy and tear apart relationships because we're on a mission. And next week, together as a group, we're going to come together and talk about what that mission is, Lord. And you know that once we're on mission, that we are an unstoppable force. Lord, we pray against the enemy 